Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me acknowledge we are led by our minister uh, in the department, Minister Mondli Gungubele. We, he is joined by the DM, uh, DM Fili uh, Mapulane, and our DG, um, uh, Nungumbela Jordan Gyani. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge our CEOs of entities that have uh, <clears throat> decided to join us today. We have the chairperson of CETA, we have the deputy uh, uh, chairperson of the SABC, um, the administrator of Postbank is also here. We are also joined by the CEO of BBI. Um, we are also joined by the acting CEO of Centec, uh, CEO of Nemisa, I saw him earlier, um, uh, the group CEO of the SABC, uh, acting CEO of Postbank, the CEO of Dodzetna, uh, and BR BRP uh, representatives, uh, DG and uh, DDGs that are here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are going to be running a standard media briefing. Uh, the minister is going to present, after which uh, we will open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, thank you, Takari, Program Director. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I reinforce the apology for late start. Uh, I want to read uh, the briefing as follows on the performance of the department. On the 17th of May, 2023, we delivered the department's 2023-24 budget vote in Cape Town. We highlighted the milestones and evolution of communications and digital technologies in our country over the years. There has been notable advancement in our society and how technology has made it possible for our people to stay informed, regardless of their location. We have also made several commitments for which we want to update South Africans about today. Fellow South Africans, we remain firmly committed to our impact statement, set in the following manner, a digitally enabled South Africa inclusive, competitive economy and digital society in, at large. Briefly looking back at the past 30 years of democracy, our country has achieved the following in ICT. First, we have eight submarine cables on the east and west coast with more expected to be launched. That's an indication of investor confidence. This investment bolstered us from damning internet outage we and the rest of the continent suffered a few weeks ago. We have over 36 data centers in our country, and we are leading the continent with the greatest number of tier four data centers. We're number 10 globally on the internet traffic, and once again, having the greatest number of internet exchange points. We have a mobile subscription base of over 167%, and although not at the speed we desire, data costs are coming down. We've witnessed that. All this confirms, if I open quote, the ICT industry plays a pivotal role in South Africa's development and economic growth with a marked size estimated at 320 billion, close quote. Now connecting Africa as a continent while we have endeavored to increase internet speeds and universal meaningful connectivity countrywide, we have also made strides to significantly reduce the cost of data. Simply put, ladies and gentlemen, where our flagship program, South Africa Connect Visits, villages are left connected to internet at an incredibly affordable rate of five rand or a little bit more a day per one gig and as little as 250 
rand a month on an unlimited package. We are dedicated to bridging the digital divide by providing Wi-Fi access to communities and ensuring universal access to the internet. This year, we have connected over 740,000 households to the internet enabled by installation of no less than 4,250 Wi-Fi hotspots. This work involved participation of no less than 76 internet service providers or SMMs, SMME in this instance, which are SMMEs and resulted in 4,500 direct jobs and many more direct job opportunities downstream. Going forward, we aim to cover rural and township areas by 1.5 million household connection enabled by no less than 8,450 wife out spot, which will happen no less than the end of this year. 5.5 million households connected via 32,055 wife out spot in three to four years. Beyond this infrastructure investment in communities at large, we have also focused our attention on, on enabling learners in rural to be rural schools, beg your pardon, to be connected to internet and are equipped with skills to ready them for the future true CETA cyber labs, a previously reserved, which was previously reserved for urban schools. We have also so far launched these smart schools in Guazulu Natal, the Popo, Eastern Cape, the Northwest, and Northern Cape provinces, with more yet to be established in other parts of the country. In addition to the computer laboratory and equipment that comes with it, learners receive skills training in robotics, coding, and digital skills. However, we have not neglected the importance of skills development in a wider context. If I were to speak on this topic, in preparing our youth who are the future inheritors of digital transformation and digital economy, we are recently launched, we, have rec we recently launched the National Digital Skills Forum made up of academia and captains of industry and trusted in ensuring that the wishes of the frameworks are manifested. As part of the implementation of the National Digital and Future Skills Strategy, our department partnered with NEMISA to launch what we call the Yaruna Digital Skills Program, which is a digital skills massification drive that empowers youth in particular and offer them an opportunity to become a digital skills ambassadors to train their communities in digital skills. The program has been successfully rolled out in the Northwest, KwaZulu-Natal, the Popo and Free State provinces. It is currently underway in the Eastern Cape province and is intended to be rolled out to all provinces in our country. To date, over 20,000 citizens in these provinces have been successfully trained ambassadors on basic digital literacy concepts. On the next generation spectrum and broadcast digital migration, as previously reported, we've completed the broadcasting digital migration and analog switch off to allow for more spectrum release. We have spectrum above 700 megawatts, mega, mega, megahertz, which enabled the availability of high demand spectrum for licensing by CASA and subsequent utilization by mobile operators. It is that spectrum that will connect the public institutions and deploy 4G and 5G throughout our country. Second step in this process will be to temporarily accommodate some of the to below 692 megawatts and the final switch off by 31st December this year. In the time, we are continuing to install set of box, boxes in outstanding households. Cabinet approved the next generation spectrum policy intended for economic development on the 25th of November 2023. Working with our mobile operators as part of their social obligation, we will connect, ladies and gentlemen, no less than 20,878 public basic education institutions, health and clinics, public libraries, etc., 
and offices, and that includes residents of traditional leaders to the internet over the next three years. Furthermore, to address the issue of costly data prices, ICASA will be publishing the outcomes of coal termination rate and data market study this, this financial year. This will give more transparency and help to respond to the public country regarding the high cost of data in our country. The digitiz on the digitization of government services. Through the State Information Technology Agency, which is CETA, commonly known, we have developed a national e-government portal with 92 digital, digitized government services. This past year, the digitized services have attracted utilization of over 899,394 logins with over 1.4 million registered users. In this financial year, CETA will ensure 98% core network availability for 7,570 connected government sites, cutting across national and provincial departments. Complementing SA Connect program, CETA will launch a national broadband project worth at least six billion that will be awarded per region and ensure that government reduces the cost and duplication of connectivity infrastructure from municipalities up to national government level. This project will ensure that designated groups such as enterprises owned by women and youth are empowered with at least 40% value of these projects whilst creating opportunities for innovative locally developed solutions to find tractions in our market. Work has begun to improve key, key value chains and processes of CETA towards meeting efficiency expectations in building a resilient modern digital environment for an involving South Africa. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, a special directed intervention in the form of CETA ministerial task team to fast track procurement backlogs has commenced work. CETA is in the process of meeting all clusters and provinces to find solutions to all their agent ICT challenges. Saving South African Post Office. In this area, South African Post Office business rescue plan was adopted by more than required 75% of creditors on the 7th December 2023. Our aim is to save the entity and ensure business continuity. It is important to note that South African Post Office remains fully operational and committed to delivering essential services to the people of Africa. Despite the current challenges, the public can still expect to receive their letter posts, courier packages, renew their VAT licenses, withdraw their social grants, and receive their chronic, chronic medication through SAPO. As announced by the Minister of Finance during the 2023 budget speech, SAPO has been allocated 2.4 billion to assist in bringing stability to the entity. Saving South African Post Office and turning it around into effective, innovative, and financially viable entity remains the foremost priority of this government. The structured post office will be agile and cost effective. The BRP continues to engage labor representatives to ensure a seamless process on labor related issues in this regard. The branch closures will be effected in a manner that does not compromise the universal service obligation of SAPO. In the area of commercial bank towards a fully fledged state-owned bank, we are, we are happy to report stability and seamless performance of the South African Post Office Bank as one, Post Bank as one of the main distributors of our social security grants. The Post Bank will service close to 5 million grant beneficiaries and close to 3 million other customers, making it an admired institution by most banks well, in the world at large. Post Bank is on track with its banking license obligations, but we must never overlook the current licenses that the bank already possesses. These licenses are the financial service provider license and the designated clearing system participation license, 
both of which give the bank authority not only to issue cards, but also to offer financial services, including the sale of insurance. Post Bank, for the first time in nine years, has appointed a permanent CEO with over 15 years' experience in banking. It has also filled other critical posts like Chief Financial Officer, Chief Financial uh, CFO, co Company Secretary, and Chief Audit Executive in recent months. Over the next three years, Post Bank intends to focus on establishing business capabilities that will stabilize, build, and differentiate the bank to ensure each market segment is catered for and their customers' needs met, Post Bank has stabilized customer value propositions. The bank is currently testing the new banking cards, which have already been verified by Visa as being compliant. This is the biggest step the business has ever achieved in the variation notice over the past three years. We are also in the process of finalizing the appointment of the new board. On the SABC, Working with the members of parliament, progress has been made to turn around fortunes of our public broadcaster, the South African Broadcasting Corporation. The new board continues to carry out its fiduciary duties, having just appointed a, a, a vibrant young woman as its CEO, Ms. Nom Sachabedi. She's amongst us here. Other notable executive appointments at SABC are the company secretary, Chief Financial Officer and Executive for Sales. We recently introduced the SABC Bill in Parliament, which seeks to, amongst others, address the outdated funding model. The bill seeks to reposition SABC to address the outdated funding model. The bill also seeks to reposition the SABC to respond to the trends that are happening globally in the space of broadcasting. I would like to congratulate the public broadcaster on the launch of SABC Plus platform that allows people to access SABC content from any digital device. I'm sure that millions of viewers are excited that they are now able to access 24 hours news channels in all official languages and dedicated sports channel. This shows how the public broadcaster is modernizing and digitizing. Lastly, on the artificial intelligence, the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which was chaired by His Excellency President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa, concluded a report which was adopted by Cabinet 26 November 2020. The PC4IR report emphasized the need for a comprehensive approach on adoption of artificial intelligence technology. The department has embarked on a process of concluding the draft national AI plan which approaches the computing system in a logical flow that will provide impetus for adoption and provision of direction to all stakeholders. As such, we will be convening the National AI Government Summit tomorrow to share the contents of the draft National AI Plan with stakeholders. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, let me invite you, members of the media, to this inaugural summit where we will chat the course towards the use of AI as a tool to address the social and economic prospects of our country. Please continue to listen to your public and community radio stations, monitor the social media platform of the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies and its entities to get the latest information about the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to open the floor up now for questions and answers. Uh, please, as you know, uh, introduce yourself and where you're from and uh, serve us with your question. Haiti. Um, Minister, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, as the business rescue practitioners can answer. But there are reports going around that um, there are going to be about 4,700 jobs that are going to be cut. I don't know if the system is working. 
Okay. Let me just start again. So it's Heidi Jockers from ENCA. I just want to um, get clarity, Minister, on this on the reports that 4,700 jobs are going to be cut at the post office. Are you able to tell us if that's the actual number? Because there's a lot of numbers that have been going around about job cuts at the post office. And also, if uh, the business rescue practitioners have the money to pay out these retrenchment packages for the jobs that are going to be cut. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Is there any other question? Yes. Um, my name is Gloria from SABC News. Um, I understand there was a request of about 3.8 billion to support the restructuring of the post office. With the amount that's been allocated so far, how is that going to impact on on the business rescue plan and also on the SABC? Um, the issue of a wage dispute currently. Um, on the SABC, there's supposed to be a protest this afternoon, from my understanding. Um, how far is are the parties in terms of getting closer to a resolution? And uh, with the elections uh, coming up next month, how is this um, in any way? Is this in any way impacting on the coverage plan for the public broadcaster for the elections? Thank you, Gloria. Any other questions? Uh, should we just check questions online? They are? Okay. This is from Nakita Abraham from New 24 Business. Has the post office decided on which branches it will close? If so, can we have the list? The second question is what is the status of post office's business rescue practitioners' request for? a 3.8 billion bailout. What will happen what to the post without the bailout? And the third question is, does the SABC plan to discuss options for additional allocation from Treasury forward to help the fund its public savings mandate? And the last question is, what is the minister's reaction to the postponement of the SABC bill to the new administration? And will this impact the plans and finances of the SABC in the future? Thank you very much. Uh, I see, Minister, most of these questions are around uh, the post office. Would you like to? Yeah, I hope we we'll have beer because, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, jo Joko. Heidi Jokos. I've worked with you for years. Maybe I'm getting old. <laughs> okay, Heidi. Uh, we, the issue of number of jobs to be cut, we prefer that it be addressed by the what to call by the BRP themselves. Because maybe people will, under, will think that we're avoiding this question. Let me tell you why. A business rescue plan is a statutory plan. And it is under the control of the business, what you call. But in your plan that is adopted in, uh, in December, there was an indicative number, as you all know. But there is a negotiation with the workers where we have been encouraging that everything should be done if possible to reduce that what call that number. But what exact number is gonna come out, they are better placed to what to call to do that idea. Right? Naturally, money for job cuts, there's money they, they, for, for whatever thing they will be doing to rescue the post office, there is going to, they, it will have to be funded. Remember, the choice of rescue was an option between itself and liquidation. And for rescue to take place, court had to agree and give an order. But for that to happen, government had to actually make certain undertakings. So those undertakings are to ensure that all the obligations that are necessary 
to assist the rest of the post office towards solvency, those at, whether it's financial or otherwise. Uh, SABC, I think there are two critical questions about SABC. SABC, if colleagues have been watching television when SABC was presenting their turnaround plan, it's, it's not a secret that SABC is on a state of insolvency. But we've got management that has come with very innovative ideas, which we intend to support, which have already demonstrated that the interventions articulated in that plan, implemented properly, have an ability to take SABC out of where it is. Now, the issue of the disputes that is taking place between SABC and the, and the, and the employees, all what we know is that uh, the, the engagements are ongoing. Maybe the CEO, given a space, can actually give an idea where those are. As I'm talking to you now, uh, the Federation is also engaging us with regard to the same issues. The, 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 there's an attempt to discuss the best possible outcome of those what to call of those engagement. But SABC is here, they might want to give a detail of that. On the SABC funding, I think I've answered that question. Uh, the bill, if I understood the question, I'm not sure. You, you wanted to check if the bill is going to make any difference. No, um, I understand in the medium, before the medium term budget, uh, post office is requested about 3.8 billion. Yes. To, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to help the restructuring process. Mm. Um, I mean, with that money not being allocated in the budget, how is that going to impact on the restructuring of the post office? Oh, listen, uh, the, the principle is that when government makes an undertaking, a way to actually fulfill that undertaking will be found. I do not want to speak on behalf of Treasury, whether they are going to use the budget appropriation or a medium term, whatever, but the government made an official committee and that obligation is part of the court, what to call order. The point, the bottom line is that it's going to be done, but Treasury is a better place uh, to explain how it's going to be done. Of course, for Treasury to actually accede to that, there must be a clear plans by PRP on how that money is going to be used because a treasurer is not going to allocate that money uncritically. So the obligation is there. We expect it to be met because it's a cabinet decision and it's also a court order. I'm not sure if, if I answered all the questions. Thanks. Minister, there were some questions that were online that I just want to check if they were all answered. Could you please go over them again, if you don't mind? Uh, the first question was, uh, post office decided on which branches it will close. If so, can you... Can you repeat what? Can you say that fresh? Sorry, we're talking. Uh, has the post office decided on which branches it will close? If so, can we have the... Ooh. 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 Uh, were the others answered? Is that the only one? That was the only one that was not answered? Yes. Okay. Uh, Minister, then we can give the GCEO okay. a chance. The last time we spoke with the PRP, if you remember, the post, the branches would have been 1,000 and above. The last time we had an engagement, the indicative number was about 600 and something, but I don't want to give you the specific number. And again, we will make sure that they give us the exact number of those branches which are going to be closed. And I want to make this point uh, so that people understand when BRP speaks about reduction of branches, 
if you remember, we're dealing with the post office that has financial challenges. The interventions are to ensure that it becomes viable. Even the number of branches that it's going to have are going to are those branches which are going to make it, it stays afloat as it recover and heals and make sure that the minimum obligations like universal service obligations are actually met. But that's the little answer I could give to you. But I cannot give you the exact names of the branches because as they work on these, they keep on uh, finding a particular character as they deal with them. So they are better place. One day you might need to have uh, a briefing with the PRPs themselves. And I know they are able, they will be able to answer all these questions. All what we can say, the post office is on course towards being rescued. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I don't know if we can give the uh, GCO of the SABC a chance before we take the second and last round. Yes. Uh, yes, it would. It would be prudent. Okay. Good afternoon, Minister, Deputy Minister, and to the DG, the CEOs present, and to the members of the media. I'm here specifically to address the question about the wage dispute that was asked earlier. It's a very important question. I think it's important for me to just go through the genealogy of events that has taken place. SABC has offered SABC employees a 6% increase, but that 6% is staggered. For example, at an executive management level, the increase was actually 3%. So there I'm talking about group executives and executives, that increase was 3%. General managers and other managers, it was 5%. And the bargaining uh, council, the union, it, the bargaining union, it was 6%. It's imperative to say that that date of when it came into effect was the 1st of October, 2023. And SABC has two unions, which is Bemawi and CWU. Bemawi has signed and accepted the increase effective the 1st of October. And we haven't reached consensus with CWU. But subsequently what we've done is that we've been in engagement with the union. And um, at the last engagement that we've had is that from an SABC perspective, it's imperative for us to be responsible from a fiscal perspective. If you think about the salary increase that we've given in, in light of the forecast loss that's going to be coming in at year end 31st of March that has just ended, it just goes to show how deep the SABC board and, you know, had to dig in order to be able to fund the salary increase. So it's very imperative for me to point that out. And we did this because we understand that SABC employees have not received an increase for a while now, and therefore the board did prioritize granting of that increase. However, what has happened is that the response that we've given to CWU is that SABC were in, on the road to recovery from a financial perspective. Minister referred, for example, to our corporate plan and our strategy that was presented to, to Parliament last week. And what's imperative out of that is that we really are concentrating on our financial viability and ensuring that you know, our liquidity concerns are addressed. And what we are saying to the union is that we are very committed to ensuring that our employees are taken care of and that they are actually numerated for the work that they do. And therefore, what we have asked is to be given a chance so that we are able to implement the innovative solutions that we've come up with, that we'll be giving some, some time to actually put those into play and then meet in September of 2024 to review our financial position and therefore we are able then to say to the unions this is how much you know money we've got and therefore we can backdate to the 1st of April. So the point of contention where we haven't reached consensus is actually not the amount of the increase it's actually the backdate date of the effective you know the effective date of the increase itself. I hope that has answered the question. Please. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Jiseo. Um, could you please take the last round of questions before we close? Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, any more questions? Any questions online? Okay. Please just raise your voice a little bit. Um, yes, it's for our team. You've got some IT work. Our first question is, when you said in the parliamentary report, it was indicated that the broadband in Bronco and Centec is, is at an advanced stage. However, this is still dependent on the revision of the BPIS turnaround plan to establish funding requirements. Will this measure be completed by the end of this administration or when it is likely to be completed? The second question is, when will CETA launch the National Broadband Project? And the last question is, Minister briefed the Portfolio Committee recently and mentioned that the country is, at, is on track to end dual elimination. Will the final analog switch of the deal is a death blow with audience loss? All right. Are those all going once, going twice? Okay. Do we do we have more? Okay. Uh, from the first question, they say the news that the answer from uh, an SABC. Does the SABC plan to discuss options for additional allocation going forward to help funds in public yes. service mandates? Yes. And what is the minister's reaction to the postponement of the SABC bill to the new administration? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know who I should allow first. Uh, he's going to tell it. I'll come to deal with her, her unhappiness. Okay. Yeah. Is is the GCO going to come in this round? The DMO will take care of them. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to deal with uh, just a few issues. I think the first one is uh, the closure of uh, postal networks. The information that we get, just to add on the, the, the input by the minister, what the BRPs have told us is that uh, there is a need, I think, as you know, to reduce the branch network so that uh, the, the networks can be in line with the, the financial viability as they projected. And uh, we are looking at having just over 600 uh, branches that will continue to remain. It's over 600, I think it's about 660 or so. That will continue to service. But what they say is that in addition to having those branches existing, they are going to have what they call point of presence. So it means even if there is no branches, but there will be a kind of service that will be offered where the branches have closed. The next question which... I would like to respond to it's coming from the from online it's on the bbi and centec measure or the acquisition of bbi by centec i think as you know that we have been uh, uh, we have been advocating 
for the establishment of what we call the state digital infrastructure company, where we are seeking to consolidate the digital infrastructure asset of the state into one company. And you know that uh, in line with our next generation spectrum policy, we are suggesting as part of the spectrum reforms that they uh, will allocate some of the spectrum to this digital infrastructure company so that it can roll out the, the infrastructure and assist the SMMEs with the last mile connectivity. So we are on course in as far as establishing that a state digital infrastructure company is concerned. But the merger between BBI and Centec has unfortunately been delayed by a number of uh, technical aspects because some of the assumptions that we made at the beginning of the measure are unfortunately no longer there currently. Uh, from a financial perspective and all of that. And so we, we don't anticipate, unfortunately, that this uh, acquisition or this measure will take place before the end of this administration. On the uh, SABC bill, I must say that we are disappointed that uh, the sixth parliament is not able to process this bill. We're really looking forward to parliament processing and finally approving this bill. Because as we know that uh, we are seeking to reposition the SABC bill, the SABC as a corporation through some of the reforms that we are suggesting in the bill. I think all of us know that uh, the broadcasting landscape has significantly changed over the past couple of years and uh, we needed to reposition the SABC to be able to play in that uh, media and broadcasting space uh, through the bill. One of the things that uh, is introduced there is the funding model of, uh, of the SABC. Uh, so we thought that Parliament was going to process that uh, but unfortunately as we know that because of uh, the fact that parliament has almost risen. So that bill is not going to be processed in the current uh, parliament. But there are a couple of measures that have been implemented by the corporation, by the board to be able to turn around uh, the fortunes of the SABC. But we hope that in the next, uh, in the next parliament, uh, this bill will be processed because it's quite crucial that uh, we have a new legislation, but also to, to comply with the previous court orders. One of the fundamental reforms, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that we know that we are seeking to do through this bill is to separate the, the commercial and the public service mandate so that the public service mandate of the SABC can be properly funded by the fiscals. That is one of the reforms that we are proposing there because as we look at the numbers currently, the, the commercial aspect of the SABC is funding part of the public service mandate. So the SABC is not properly funded from the fiscals in terms of its public service mandate. The SO uh, analog switch off, I think the minister did uh, convene a press conference here to explain to the nation that there is an agreement reached with the broadcasters, which we were terming it as a two-stage uh, solution. That the first one was to uh, uh, anything above 700 megahertz was terminated by the 31st of July last year. So what is remaining is the final analog switch off by the 31st of December, where in uh, all the some of the the analog broadcasting site which are situated in many of the major metropolitan areas are going to be finally switched off at the end of uh, this calendar year, which will put to rest finally 
the broadcasting digital migration. Thank you. I don't know what to do, Heidi, to make you happy. Maybe let's put it this way. The convention is that rescue plans take between 12 and 18 months. We, we expect this one not to go beyond that. I suspect there is a possibility that it might even do less than that. But I want to insist, Heidi, maybe I was saying to DJ, maybe we're not supposed to, 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 to what to call, to even refer to them. So that, because if we refer to them, we are supposed to anticipate that question by Heidi. But we are, we are following them. We've got an oversight team. We know what they are doing, but because of the nature and their independence, we prefer that the details at all material times be given by them. Because at the end of the day, the implications of the answer they gave, they are the one responsible to actually deal with that. I, so I appeal to you, Heidi, to accept this principle. And I'm saying to you, maybe to make you happy, we need a special briefing by PRPP. I don't think they will have a problem with that because I, I think the nation is interested in that. Uh, I think GM has dealt with the B B SABC bill nicely in the model and so on. Uh, we we continue to engage Treasury on funding, what to call the, the SABC. Maybe the point should be made and we made it in Parliament. Generally, we all agree that the, 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 the funding of the SABC is not adequate. I don't think that's a secret. So, but it's a matter that must be an expression of policy, taking into account a number of factors. At the end of the day, we hope to nudge one another to a point where SABC is properly what to call funded. And this bill, by the way, seeks to actually attend to those issues. So engaging Treasury on options, including the type of licensing, all those issues will continue to engage with Treasury around those. Thanks. And I must say, as a minister, Heidi, having looked at the performance of the department, just this financial year from April 2023, I am not disappointed. There's a, there are challenges that we need to deal with, but in overall, I'm okay with the work they have done. There's a long way, there's a, there's a lot to be done, but there's a lot that has been what to call, that has been done. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, DM, DG, uh, GCEO, the CEOs in the room, um, colleagues in the media, thank you for joining us. That concludes our um, engagement this afternoon. If there are further questions, uh, we are here to deal with them still afterwards. Thank you, colleagues.